Liebe Beiratsmitglieder, liebe Fellows, liebe Freunde des Hauses, ich freue mich, Sie zu dem heutigen Beiratsvorabend zu begrüßen und freue mich vor allem, Jim zu begrüßen, der zu uns sprechen wird. Jim is going to speak in English, which is not completely self-evident before, because the last lecture you gave here, if I remember correctly, was a lecture in German. But as Jim's German is far better than my English, I will introduce him in German. <laughs> Jim Kernand studierte Philosophie und Wissenschaftsgeschichte in Exeter, Göttingen, Kyoto und Harvard, wo er promovierte. Dann war er Professor für Philosophie in Pittsburgh und seit 1999 an der University of Chicago. Er war Fellow 2008-2009 ist seit 2010 Mitglied des Beirats. Schwerpunkt der Forschungen Wittgenstein, das ist relativ klar, der frühe und der späte, die Jim im Gegensatz zu vielen anderen Kollegen nicht als zwei unterschiedliche Philosophen betrachtet. Aber auch Kant, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Patnam, Rorty, Cabell und daneben immer wieder Aufsätze zum Film, aus denen hervorgeht, dass Jim nicht nur ein sehr guter Leser, sondern auch ein sehr guter Betrachter ist. Zuletzt, nämlich 2014, ist von ihm eine Monographie über Nietzsche erschienen, deren Inhalt teilweise aus dem Englischen übersetzt, teilweise aber auch direkt auf Deutsch geschrieben wurde und ich möchte versuchen, anhand dieser Monographie kurz zu skizzieren, worin ich die spezifische Qualität seiner Philosophie sehe. Dabei beschränke ich mich auf zwei Punkte. Erstens, Nietzsche ist ein intensiver Leser von Ralph Waldo Emerson gewesen. Und diese Lektüre von Emerson hat in Nietzsches Texten einen starken Niederschlag gefunden. Dabei verweist Nietzsche gelegentlich ausdrücklich auf Emerson, indem er ihn nennt. Sehr häufig aber natürlich, natürlich, wenn man Nietzsche kennt, nicht. Da nennt er den Namen nicht. Diese stillschweigende Abhängigkeit von Emerson ist in der deutschsprachigen Nietzsche-Forschung, wie mir scheint, weitgehend übersehen worden. Ich bin kein Nietzsche-Forscher, aber mir war das vollkommen neu. Und das hängt natürlich damit zusammen, dass für deutschsprachige Nietzsche-Leser Emerson nicht zum Kanon gehört. Ich hatte nie eine Zeile von ihm gelesen. Und ich bin, glaube ich, in relativ guter Gesellschaft. Und für Amerikaner wiederum gehört Emerson zum Kanon, aber auch amerikanische Leser haben Nietzsches Abhängigkeit von Emerson sehr oft übersehen. Und das liegt daran, dass in der englischen Nietzsche-Übersetzung jene Passagen, die Nietzsche von Emerson übernommen hatte, in der Nietzsche-Übersetzung ins Englische diese Passagen einen völlig anderen Wortlaut bekamen, sodass sie als Emerson-Zitate gar nicht mehr zu identifizieren waren. Soweit Jims philologischer Befund. Aber dieser Befund hat natürlich auch eine philosophische Pointe. Man hat in den USA, aber auch in der deutschsprachigen Rezeption, Nietzsche immer wieder als einen Antidemokraten gebrannt mag und ihm die These zugeschrieben, wonach es in der Menschheitsgeschichte einzig und allein auf die großen, die ganz großen Individuen ankomme, die Masse haben ihm gegenüber lediglich eine dienende Funktion zu erfüllen. Nun zeigt sich, dass ausgerechnet die zentrale Passage, die als Beleg dafür gilt, von Emerson stammt und damit von einem der wichtigsten Vordenker der amerikanischen Demokratie. Durch den Zusammenhang wird klar, dass Emerson und Nietzsche mit ihm die großen Menschen nicht als eine getrennte Spezies sondern als exemplarische Vorbilder betrachtet, denen jedermann nacheifern könnte und sollte. 
Nietzsches Ziel besteht also nicht in der Legitimierung einer Kastengesellschaft, sondern umgekehrt darin, dass er seine Leser dazu aufruft, über sich selbst und über ihre Vorbilder hinauszuwachsen. Und genau in diesem Sinne ist auch der berühmte Übermensch zu verstehen. Das scheint mir ein wunderbares Beispiel für die Aufdeckung transatlantischer Bezüge, die dazu dienen, einem gemeinsamen, einem philosophischen Gemeinplatz den Boden unter den Füßen wegzuziehen. Aber fast noch wichtiger schien mir nach Ende der Lektüre des Buches der zweite Punkt. Eine zentrale Rolle spielt in Nietzsche Schriften die vage, vage an Kant erinnernde Behauptung, dass jede Wahrheit eine Frage der Perspektive sei. Mein Standpunkt bedingt unweigerlich das, was ich von der Welt sehe. Nun kann man Perspektive sehr unterschiedlich definieren. Um zwei extreme Beispiele zu nennen, wenn man ein und dasselbe Objekt von vorne, von hinten oder von unten sieht, stellt es sich, falls es nicht zufällig eine Kugel ist, immer in unterschiedlicher Form dar. Die verschiedenen Perspektiven sind freilich miteinander kompatibel bzw. verhalten sich zueinander komplementär. Anders ist es aber, wenn man die jeweilige Perspektive als eine Insel auffasst, von der es keine drinnen gibt. Dann gibt es keine Möglichkeit, von einer Perspektive in die andere zu wechseln. Die einzelnen Perspektiven erweisen sich oder werden zu geschlossenem und inkommensurablen Systemen untereinander inkommensurabel. In seinem Buch nun zeigt Jim meines Erachtens völlig überzeugend, dass Nietzsche zwar als ein Perspektivist der zweiten Art bedingt, bedient, also als einer der Perspektiven als inkommensurabel betrachtet, sich im Lauf seines Lebens aber in einen Perspektivisten der ersten Art verwandelt. Indem Jim diesen Nachweis führt, zeichnet er den Prozess von Nietzsches Denken nach. Und plötzlich sieht man, den Philosophen Nietzsche, wie er sich an Problemen abarbeitet und wie er von einer Lösung zur nächsten übergeht. Dabei wird deutlich, dass es zwischen dem frühen und dem späten Nietzsche gewaltige Unterschiede gibt, ähnliche Unterschiede wie die zwischen dem frühen und dem späten Kant oder dem frühen und dem späten Wittgenstein, nur dass diese Unterschiede außerordentlich schwer aufzudecken sind, weil Nietzsche, anders als Kant und Wittgenstein, sich nicht explizit mit seinen früheren Ansichten auseinandersetzt. Der Denkprozess vollzieht sich stillschweigend, gewissermaßen subkutan, von Aphorismus zu Aphorismus. Erst wenn man diesen Denkprozess rekonstruiert, wird Nietzsche als Philosoph überhaupt in seiner Arbeitsweise greifbar. Erst jetzt gerät man in die Lage, Nietzsches Texte nicht mehr als einen amorphen Zitatenschatz sondern als das Ergebnis einer konsequenten und kontinuierlichen Denkbewegung zu verstehen. Das ist, wie mir scheint, ein unerhörter Gewinn für dann alle Nietzsche-Leser, Jim Conan, nur dankbar sein können. Nun aber endlich zum heutigen Abend, in dem es, wie vorhin hier stand, nicht um Nietzsche, sondern um Thomas Kuhn gehen wird. Und dazu noch eine ganz kleine Anmerkung. In den Akten des Kollegs hat sich ein Brief von Peter Wapniewski erhalten, datiert auf den 5. November 1981, adressiert an Thomas Kuhn, zu jener Zeit Stipendiat der Siemens Stiftung in München. Wapniewski bezieht sich auf Michael Krüger, der als Fellow nach Weihnachten bei uns sein wird. Michael Krüger hatte den Kontakt hergestellt, auf den beruft sich Wapniewski und freut sich darauf, wie er schreibt, dass Thomas Kuhn am 16. November, also weniger als zwei Wochen später, einen Vortrag im Wissenschaftskolleg halten werde mit dem Titel What are Scientific Revolutions? Ob Thomas Kuhn diesen Vortrag am 16. November vor 33 Jahren wirklich gehalten hat, ergibt sich aus den Akten. Leider nicht. <lacht> Doch gibt es keinen Zweifel daran, dass Jim Conant seinen Vortrag <lacht> halten wird, und zwar jetzt. <lacht> Danke, Luca, für die nette Einladung. Uh, I'll talk this
evening about Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. I'm told it's the best-selling academic work of the 20th century. I don't know if that's true, but it seems plausible. I know my university's press, the University of Chicago Press, made a lot of money from that book. Um, I will just call it Structure from now on, for sure. Um, structure has been widely criticized by all sorts of people in all sorts of ways, but perhaps most vehemently by philosophers. There is, I think, um, no single set of sentences or moments in the book that have drawn more criticism than the remarks I am hoping you see up there. Yes, uh, those two quotations. Um, I'll read them both to you. These are just examples of a kind of sentence that recurs, starting in chapter 10 of that book. Um, the first one's from the beginning of chapter 10. Quote, with a change of paradigm, the scientist afterwards works in a different world. And second quotation, when paradigms change, the world itself changes with them. <coughs> at the end of my lecture today, I want us to look at um, the context of that second quotation, a little under an hour from now. But before we do, let me just say this about them for now. These remarks have been taken by Kuhn's critics, especially though not only his philosophical critics, to represent attempts on the part of the author to put forward a claim about the relation between theory and reality, in particular scientific theory and observed reality. A claim whose exact nature and unpalatable consequences the critics usually find they need first to clarify for the reader, since Kuhn himself, we are told, is so unclear about the exact nature of his own position. So first they clarify it, and then they kill it. Um, indeed, a casual survey of the literature on Kuhn reveals, I did a word search on this, it's amazing how frequently these two words occur, the most common epithets employed by philosophers when characterizing this putative claim that's glimmering at you through these two sentences. Um, the two most common words employed are vague, and notorious, and often both. Kuhn's vague and notorious claim that, and then we get that. Now, a central irony in this reception I want to show you tonight is that I think it's just in those moments in Kuhn's book where he's most methodologically sophisticated and is actually expressing himself in the most guarded way possible that his critics have taken to be his most, at his most thoughtless, sloppy, and naive. But what he is doing is very unusual, so I think easy to overlook. I'm not tonight in this lecture going to go into any detail at all about the particular critics I have in mind here, the precise nature of the individual criticisms, partly because of my view that this whole aspect of the philosophical reception of his book has been singularly unproductive. If someone would like details and discussion, I can talk your ears off. But what I'll do instead in the talk tonight the talk proper, is to try to formulate, in my own words, what I take Kuhn to have been up to in these passages of the book, what the overall strategy is. As will soon emerge, it's impossible to understand these remarks, apart from some understanding of some of the central lessons of the entire book, as those remarks represent an, off, an effort on the author's part to apply certain morals drawn from the argument of the book as a whole, and particularly drawn from its argument about what scientists do during periods of what Kuhn calls revolutionary crisis, certain morals drawn from his examination of that topic, to a particular set of philosophical problems that he thinks this book on the history of science has raised. Philosophical problems that he thinks at the same time when he's writing this book in the 1950s, publishing in the early 1960s. You can also see rising in art history, in linguistics, in anthropology, in psychology, a great many other subjects. And people often overlook the footnotes where he's trying to make out there some parallel crisis going on across a whole host of different subjects. These are problems arising within and are symptoms of a crisis in what Kuhn calls, over and over again in the book, the dominant epistemological paradigm of our time. That phrase of his, though it recurs, has received very little attention. <clears throat> now, if this is just right in its large structure, then it's not surprising 
that attempts to criticize Kuhn by quoting just these remarks in isolation from this larger context I just mentioned have led to complete misunderstanding. Okay, before we look at Kuhn anymore, I'm going to tell you a little story about me, or the young Jim, shall we call him, about Jim's loss of innocence. Um, so, the aim of this story is to allow us to get a little clearer about what is meant by saying these remarks represent an effort on the author's part to apply certain morals, drawn from the argument of the book as a whole, to a particular philosophical problem, or as Kuhn later came to think, a set of problems. I think when he wrote the book, he thought it was one big problem. The first step here, and this is the point of the story, is to become clear about what is meant by a problem. The following anecdote is supposed to provide a way to approach this issue. It grows out of my first attempt as an undergraduate to take a philosophy course. As it happens, as may be true for many of you, it might be your only attempt, um, it was not a happy one. It was my freshman year at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a few hours north of New York City. And um, having not grown up in the United States myself, my freshman year in college was in many ways, culturally, intellectually, linguistically, and otherwise, a culture shock. At the time, I thought of myself as on my way to becoming a physics major. Um, that was a lingua franca I spoke. I also thought of myself as someone who's really quite good at mathematics. But I wasn't at all sure what philosophy was, exactly. Um, or anyhow, how philosophy could be the name of a serious academic form of inquiry. I remember many years later when I told my parents I was actually going to go to graduate school in philosophy, they responded as if I had told them I was going to graduate school in transcendental yoga or something. Um, and at that time, that was roughly as much as I understood of it. Um, but anyhow, I thought I should try to find out what philosophy is. So I went to the first meeting of a philosophy course. The professor's name was Robert Nozick, a name some of you may recognize. Gunter's already excited. And um, the title of the course was Metaphysics, suggesting to me at the time it ought to be somewhere in the vicinity of my interest. After all, the word physics was embedded right in the title. How different could it be? Nozick gets down to business immediately. Frame breaking, Nozick says, is the key to progress in philosophy. That's his first sentence in the class. He announces this in his strong Brooklyn accent. I am not going to try to imitate a Brooklyn accent, but try to hear it for a few paragraphs now. The classroom is packed to capacity. I'm still looking for somewhere to sit. Nozick goes on, ladies and gentlemen, do you know what I mean by frame breaking? No response. Let me illustrate. And just as I find a seat, Nozick turns to the blackboard and very slowly, slowly proceeds to write down a series of numbers. Turning around to look at the class after he writes each number, allowing a reasonable interval of time to elapse so that the significance of this next member of the series can fully sink in. Now, Nozick says, as soon as you see, and you, I invite you all to do this, we can play Nozick's game again tonight. As soon as you see, Stephen or Gunther, how to continue the series, I want to raise your hand. And the numbers gradually begin to appear on the board. First 14, then 18. Good, I think to myself, noting that the interval is too square. That's going to matter. I'm ready for the coming intervals to be ascending the values of some function like n to the second power, or perhaps 2 to the nth power. I'm, I'm, I'm on it. Then comes the next number, 23. The interval between 18 and 23 is 5. Not a clean case of the square or anything I think we should get into. But 5 is the first prime after the first value of 2 to the n, or n to the second power. Very nice. We're going to go back and forth between the next value of some, one of these exponential functions and the first prime that comes after each such value. And as I'm working out the most elegant way to express such a series in mathematical notation, the next number appears. 28. 28. The interval between 23 and 20 is 5 again. Ah. 
So we have intervals between the first four members, bearing the values four, five, and five again. I see. It's a halting function. There's going to be some kind of halting function built into the series so that each third member of the series repeats the second member for those lines. <laughs> Writing this down. There's somebody looking at me much more mathematically counterintuitive than anything I expected to find in a beginning philosophy class. But what the hell? That secretly pleases me. <laughs> I'm going to be the first one in the class to solve this puzzle. But then as I look around the room, I notice a few hands have already been raised. <laughs> Foolish of these kids to be guessing at the answer. It's such an early stage in the development of the series. I have a decent working hypothesis <laughs> of what the rough shape of the function can be. But surely you need a few more data points before you can have confidence in any such conjecture. These philosophy students are just as I would have expected. <laughs> Satisfied with just making a guess based on incredibly flimsy data set. Well, so far I think to myself, this class is just confirming my worst fears about what sort of students are drawn to philosophy. But let's get it. Next number appears on the board, 33. Ooh, the interval of five is repeated for a second time. Ah, the halting aspect of the function will be the key to the problem. All I need now is to get clear about what the environing exponential function is in which the halting feature is embedded. And the next number appears, 42. Perfect, <laughs> I've got it. That, is, that last interval is three to the second power. So the environing function must be n to the second power for each n. And then you go to the next prime, have a double halt. I see how this works. So let's see the next prime is 11. So 53 is going to be the next number of the series. But Nozick then writes 51 on the board. 51? How does that fit anything? That repeats an interval 9. We've gone straight over to the halting function in the second round, skipping the ascension of the next prime, not seeming to mirror anything in the transition from 4 to 5 that we saw at the beginning of the series. As I'm puzzling over this, the next number appears on the board, 59. That's to say an interval of 8, or I think to myself it's probably better expressed second, a, a 2 to the third power, 8. But where's the overall pattern? And then I also notice that with the appearance of this last number, 59, I don't see anyone raising their hand in this room, but in that room, in Harvard, Massachusetts, in 1974, boom, hands go up, <laughs> accompanied by murmurs, those Harvard students, at least the philosophy students, accompanied by murmurs and exclamations on the part of other students in the class, exclamations such as, oh God, now I see, or oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Just when I am most confused, the light seems to be dawning for them. How can this be? I start working furiously, still completely unable to find any rhyme or reason to the sequence. More numbers slowly appear on the board. 68, 77, this is like magic, isn't it? 86. <laughs> An interval of nine, if you notice, has now repeated itself three times in a row. A triple halt at this point. I see. But no one could have predicted with confidence that was coming based on what came before. I mean, I could write a function for it, but you kind of see that was coming, I think to myself. But now I notice that a great many students are nodding and smiling, apparently finding the series to be continuing just the way they would have expected. <laughs> then comes the next number, 96. At this point, over half the class is raising its hand. Or at least, who knows exactly. So I remember it. So it seemed to me at the time. I thought I was good at this stuff. I feel a sense of despair. Could all these philosophy students be better at math than I am? Yet more numbers appear on the board. 103, 110, 116, 125. I don't see any hands. Um, I, too, if it's any comfort to you, can discern no overall pattern whatsoever. Yet now it seems as if most of the students have their hands in the air, with big smiles on their faces, as if they'd just been let in on some sort of wonderful, but amusing secret. As I look around the classroom, I now see 
literally a sea of raised hands with, I'm embarrassed, but I'm going to tell the truth here, with no clue as to what the answer is, and a deep sense of inner shame, either my stupidity or my dishonesty, probably both, I slowly raise my hand, too, wondering how many other people <laughs> I don't want the professor to feel, I mean, the poor guy, if he needs to keep going with this infernal series until even I manage to figure it out. So Nozick stops writing and turns fully to face the class. So, you all see what my point is here. Heads nod, knowingly. That is what I mean by frame-breaking. I had no idea. <laughs> I'm also so filled with shame that I pretended to understand that it's hard for me to concentrate on anything you say next, leaving me no chance of finding out what the hell he had meant. Fortunately, I think to myself, there was this really interesting looking astrophysics class, meaning at the same time, on evolutionary cosmology. So, I decided to slip out of the classroom, thereby sparing myself any further humiliation. Who knew metaphysics would be so difficult? <laughs> it would take a year before I'd even muster the courage to attend another philosophy class. You all know how that story is. But this initial traumatic experience notwithstanding, I'd get more comfortable with philosophy and one afternoon find myself in conversation with some other philosophy students in the Harvard Dining Hall, who I recognize as also having been in Nozick's class on that fateful and embarrassing day in my freshman year. I decide the time has come to clear up the mystery. I swallow my pride. I ask, do you remember that uh, series of numbers Nozick put on the board on the first meeting of his metaphysics class? I think it was last fall. Oh, yeah. That was a wonderful example, wasn't it? <laughs> Says one of the students. I find the courage to ask. Uh, so were you able to work out on your own how to continue that series? Of course, comes the answer. It's easy. Those are the stops on the IRT. <laughs> Those are the what's on the what? I ask. You know, the Lexington Avenue subway line. Those were the Manhattan stops on 14th Street, 18th Street, 24th Street, and so on. closely related to a central point in Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, and sports structure again. The point can be made vivid, and I will try to make it vivid, by introducing the following distinction. The distinction between what Kuhn calls puzzles and what I'll call problems. It belongs to the nature of a puzzle in the sense in which Kuhn employs the term. Already back in structure, it becomes more important to him as he goes on belongs to the nature of a puzzle. The following three things belong to the nature of a puzzle. First, that it have a solution. Not a little thing, actually. Second, that it be known in advance to have one. You wouldn't spend all the time on the crossword puzzles in the newspaper if you thought, well, maybe there's an answer, maybe there isn't. Um, that it have one. And third, that it be fully determined and antecedently established what counts as a solution. So putting the matter in a somewhat more elaborate way, for something to be a puzzle, first, the methods for arriving at a solution to it must already be in place as legitimate methods, in such a way that the dimensionality of the space of possible solutions has already been delimited in advance. Hence, the form of a possible solution is predetermined, even if its matter is not fully. Second, the nature of those methods and what counts as their application the case at hand has to be uncontroversial. If only th you think you've solved the crossword puzzle, not even the maker of it, that's probably a sign that you haven't quite figured out what those kind of puzzles are. So second, the nature of the methods and their application the case at hand must be uncontroversial. That is to say, there's a background of agreement regulating the activity of solving such puzzles. And that itself presupposes an already extant community of like-minded cognoscenti. 
who are doing this, and further ones have been initiated into that community. Third, those methods are understood to have the potential to yield a solution when brought to bear on this very puzzle. That's what makes it a puzzle. Even if no actual solution has yet to be found. Now this account obviously fits things such as jigsaw puzzles and crossword puzzles and things like that, where the maker already knows the solution before you get things in a way that you have to figure it out. But it's important to Kuhn that this more general characterization I've just given, I've given it in very general terms, of what a puzzle is, also fits a whole class of intellectual problems, including, importantly, those that characterize what Kuhn calls normal science. It's important to notice here, many people have missed this, so far this is a merely stipulative or terminological point in Kuhn's book. Only to the extent that some phase of inquiry is largely taken up with difficulties of this form does it count for Kuhn as normal science. He later came to think that some of the things he claimed in his book about how these things are related and interpunctuated by non-normal science and whether you can have normal revolutionary science at the same time, so we're wrong. But the definition is not thereby threatened, it seemed to him later. Now, so much for puzzles. One, be one can begin to see what a problem is by first noting that it differs from a puzzle in all three of these ways. I think that's a good way into understanding the concept we're after. Indeed, as will become clear, failure to meet any of the three conditions I just mentioned, those three conditions of puzzlehood, is constitutive of problemhood for Kuhn. But let us not rush to that conclusion. For expository purposes, it might help to take this in two steps and to distinguish first between a weaker and a stronger concept of a problem. According to the weaker concept, a problem is something that fails to meet at least one of the above conditions of being a puzzle. If you miss out on any of them, you're not a puzzle anymore. But according to the much stronger concept of a problem, which is really the one we're after here today, I'll call it the full-blown Kuhnian concept of a problem. A problem is something that has the outward appearance of a puzzle. While failing, it turns out, upon further examination, to meet any of the three conditions mentioned on being a puzzle. Belongs the idea of a problem as opposed to a puzzle, as Kuhn deploys these terms in his characterizations of historical episodes in the history of science, that certain problems which initially appear in the guise of puzzles invite the same sort of engagement of the intellect as puzzles, but then at a certain point, as what Kuhn calls anomalies mount, eventually lead to a crisis, as the puzzle-solving methods do not seem to make progress with them. And then this question about whether we write them off, sometimes Kuhn points out they are just pushed aside, and their significance only comes later when they seem to be related to other puzzles that are not cooperating, other apparent puzzles. Nevertheless, just for the matter of terminology for a moment, for something to be properly classified as a problem, one of the things that must happen on this account is exploration must reveal it to be a sort of difficulty that increasingly seems to resist solution in ways that no mere puzzle could. So it belongs to the nature of a problem, in the sense in which I employ that term here, that it does not, in any straightforward sense that I elucidated so far, already have a solution. That is, not in the sense in which a puzzle does so that we know what the methods are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is to say, there exists no prior community or agreement about what ought to count as a solution, and thus about the precise character of the methods which are deemed suitable for approaching it. This is itself something that there comes to be disagreement about in what Kuhn calls a crisis. That's one of the constitutive marks of a crisis. There may not even be consensus at first, about what any, whether any such methods could exist. And even if they could, whether the community presently has the tools to discover them or whether they first need to be elaborated. So putting the matter in a different way, for something to be a problem in the broad sense that I'm trying to elucidate here, first, there must be some lack of agreement 
about the present availability and or precise nature of the methods required for solution. Second, whatever agreement does prevail must be such as to permit room within it for continuing disagreement about whether any given putative solution ought to count as a genuine solution. So one of the things that happens is someone says they've solved it, and someone else says, you call that a solution? Which is to say that those drawn to the problem in the relevant sense do not yet form a fully like-minded community. Third, most importantly, there must also remain room for genuine rational disagreement about whether the best available candidates for such methods we have can yield a solution when brought to bear on this puzzle slash problem. That is to say, within the relevant problem area, as long as the problem is a line one, the truth of some form of skepticism about the possibility of solving it remains a standing possibility. Now, already, according to structure, problems are necessarily intermittently, quite intermittently, but nonetheless necessarily, the concern of natural scientists. For reasons that the book tries to show are constitutive to the possibility of long-term scientific progress. Not short-term, but long-term. Now, in this more nuanced understanding of the term, problems involve the form of difficulty that, beginning at some point, Kuhn argues, in the 18th century, at least when all is going well in a particular sphere of scientific research, start getting ascribed to philosophy rather than science. And you get a certain account of what the difference between philosophy and science is in the writings of some of these figures. Leibniz is quite noticeable in the way in which physics and metaphysics are starting to separate in a way which had to do with those course titles I encountered in Harvard several centuries later, um, to my alarm. That is to say, after the 17th century, science increasingly develops in such a way that both of the following things, Kuhn thinks, can come to be true of it. First, that there's felt to be, by scientists and philosophers alike, in general, a radical difference between the sorts of problems, puzzles, whose formulation and solution typically constitute the normal business of the scientist, on the one hand, and those whose formulation and treatment const typically constitutes the business of the philosopher. Much could be said about that, but I'll move to the second point, namely that at certain junctures in the unfolding of the history of science, the activity of scientific inquiry itself inevitably also throws up problems. That is to say, difficulties whose treatment actually demands the tools of the philosopher as well as those of the scientist, so could thanks. And he tries to document this in his research about various episodes. This ambivalence in the relation between science and philosophy from the 18th century on constitutes an ongoing underlying theme of structure, one that's often gone unnoticed. The dimension of that ambivalence is actually on the surface of the text. Um, in order, Kuhn thinks, for modern science to flourish in its normal state, what it tries to do in that condition is purge itself of anything like philosophy, of anything like problems. And yet in order to progress beyond a period of revolutionary crisis, it must transform itself from within in ways that require at least some of its practitioners, the Newton, the Einstein, the Bohr, and so forth, to go in for philosophical activity as part of what we might call looking from the outside. Their scientific activity. Okay, so now I've tried to set up the background for this problem that we want to look at. Before we do um, turn to this more difficult concept of a problem, let's notice that the kind of problem we're investigating here is a very particular sort. It's a problem that comes disguised as a puzzle, at least initially. Before we turn to that difficult concept, it might help to consider an intermediate and somewhat simpler case. By this I mean a case in which a puzzle is presented in a manner which invites one to construe it as a puzzle, all right, but as a puzzle of a very different kind than it really is. Hence the real task in solving this intermediate kind of case of difficulty lies in recognizing which sort of puzzle 
the puzzle in question is. If you think it's the wrong kind of puzzle, then you're just going to keep banging away with the wrong methods. Employing the terms now introduced, we can describe what Nozick was doing in exploiting his example of the number series on the way of trying to say something very quick about metaphysics at the beginning of his class that I did not understand at all at the time. But as you see, um, I've continued to think on it. Um, something to be said for teaching classes that leave the students completely baffled. Um, what's to be said for that is, I think, connected with what Kuhn is doing in his book, as we'll see in a moment. Nozick set his class one kind of puzzle while presenting it as I mischievously, following his example, did this evening, in a manner that invited you to construe it as a puzzle of a very different kind. I called it a mathematical series. It's not false. It's a mathematical series. But that invited you to go about solving it a certain way. It invited me, certainly, back then to solve it a certain way. If I hadn't been, if I hadn't fancied myself so good at math, I might have had a better chance, but actually I don't think so, since I'd never been to New York at the time. Um, <laughs> But at least I probably have suffered less. Um, this disguise puzzle involved, we might put it this way, the crossing of two different kinds of puzzles. And this crossing, this intentional crossing, enables Nozick to highlight certain aspects of the character of the sort of difficulty that attends the solution of what I'm calling tonight a problem, as opposed to any ordinary puzzle. Namely, those aspects of a problem whose solution requires something aptly characterized by Nozick at the very first sentence of the course as the activity of frame breaking. In order to solve Nozick's disguise puzzle, and here it's like solving a genuine problem, even if it's not a case of doing that, you first need to bring about the elements constituting the apparent puzzle. You need to get them to be organized, to appear to you in a completely different conceptual frame. The elegance of Nozick's example lies in the way it illustrates this point while sparing the members of the class any involvement in the details that necessarily attend the solution of a genuinely interesting case of a problem. You can't solve a problem in metaphysics as fast as those students solve that puzzle, if you can solve it. Nozick's disguise puzzle therefore manages to illuminate certain structural differences between ordinary puzzles and real problems without ever having to entangle itself in the intricacies of the live problem. It allows you to see something about their structure without first having to spend weeks taking you into the details of a live problem. It's thereby able to simulate for those in the class who succeed in arriving at a solution of that. <laughs> It's able to simulate an aspect of the phenomenology of solving a problem that was very dear to Kuhn's heart and structure, though he becomes more suspicious at this point later. Namely, the following aspect of the phenomenology, that there's a moment in the problem solver's experience of the elements that make up the puzzle that suddenly undergoes something like a gestalt switch. As I said, that's a crucial feature of Kuhn's early account of what a problem is. And there it plays a central role in the connection he wants to draw between what he calls philosophical activity and what he calls revolutionary science. The thing that most characterizes normal science for him is what he calls puzzle solving activity. The thing that characterizes most of all, not only, but most of all revolutionary science is what he calls philosophical activity. So there's also an implicit conception here that I'll try to bring out of what philosophy is. In Kuhn. Let's start looking at that conception of philosophy he's working with for a moment. For Kuhn, it's constitutive of philosophy in this sense, and especially the part of philosophy he calls epistemology. Remember, the book in the whole, as a whole, is trying to show us something about the dominant epistemological paradigm. It's constitutive of philosophy that those who are caught up in one of its difficulties, a philosophical or epistemological difficulty, are concerned with problems rather than puzzles. The achievement of philosophical insight requires radically reorienting your view of the difficulty, the contours of which may appear self-evident, but are only apparently so. So we need to question something self-evident. And it's not clear what aspect of the self-evident we should question. And you can't just question all of it at once. 
because then you're not thinking anything. The task of the philosopher on this understanding is to find a way to reapprehend the problem. So it appears an entirely new, new light, its basic shape, and along with it, one's apprehension of what is a possible form of solution that might bear on it, are all completely transformed. This issue about an internal transformation of how we see things is not only important to his account of the problem, but also his description of what the problem is in the relationship between observation and theory, as we'll see in a moment. The author of structure not only thought that some sort of attempt to transform our view of a problem in a productive way is the sort of thing that good philosophers do or should be trying to do, but that it's also something that certain great physicists and chemists have done in negotiating certain moments of revolutionary crisis in the history of physics and chemistry. And Kuhn had a little budget of preferred examples. They might not have stretched as far as he wanted, but at least for those examples, he could try to make a compelling case. That's how to understand at least part of what happened in those episodes. That is to say, this sort of philosophical activity, he thought, was essential to making scientific progress under those circumstances. Less obvious, but also arguably essential already to Kuhn's early understanding of the matter, is the following. It's constitutive of a philosophical problem if it's really properly posed, that it has the outward initial form of a paradox. To understand such a problem is to feel that it both must admit of an answer, and that at least in the terms in which it has been stated, it cannot. Such and such a body can always go faster than any body we've seen, but nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Every wave requires a medium, but there is no ether. Something is either a particle or a wave, except this stuff that fits these equations. Um, that is to say, you haven't really felt the problem unless you see there must be a solution. And given how you presented it, it seems like you cannot have one. Once the problem clearly assumes this guidance, it no longer merely has a scientific aspect. It clearly also takes on a philosophical Partly for this reason, he thinks, the work lies in something he's willing to call philosophical activity, reformulating the problem in entirely new terms, terms which now permit a genuinely satisfying form of progress to be made. And there are different ways this can happen. And one of them is by making some aspect of the supposed problem just disappear. Hell of a move, what Einstein says. There is no ether. Stop trying to measure our movement in relation to it. Sometimes providing a further context, capable of transforming what it seemed like a paradox into a truism or a tautology, or making an axiom of the theory. Axiom one, special relativity. Nothing goes faster than the speed of light. We start with that, since we can't derive it. Sometimes by showing that the real underlying problem is of a very different character than you were initially inclined to suppose. And more often, with real problems, by employing some combination of all three of those strategies in tandem with the others. The solution to a genuine problem, Kuhn thought, ought to sound to someone who has yet to grapple with it, and yet to master the entirely new way of thinking required to solve it. The solution to such a person ought to sound entirely paradoxical. <laughs> roughly on the model of how the following sentences sounded to me when I first studied physics. It behaves just like a wave, but it doesn't require a medium. It's both a particle and a wave, while not actually being quite either. Uh, scientists who work in different paradigms, when there's a change in paradigm, live in different worlds. That is supposed to sound paradoxical. The initially seemingly paradoxical formulation should eventually take on an axiomatic or otherwise intelligible character, but only once situated in a radically new way of thinking. What is fatal to progress with what Kuhn called problems is, is an attempt to just domesticate the problem, drain it of its air of paradoxicality prematurely 
while failing to liberate oneself from the crucial assumptions and the old way of thinking that are generating the problem. Structure tries to make progress with the problem it encounters by trying to describe the history of science, and it does so by employing what I think one can only call an extraordinary strategy. And it's this strategy whose presence in the book, I think, has largely eluded its commentators. Although there's a lot of commentary written on this book. It tries to take seriously, as seriously as it can, the following idea. It is nothing less than a difficulty on the order of a philosophical problem, and thus not merely a puzzle that lies at the heart of the book, the chapter 10 is about that the notorious sentences are trying to get us to see as a problem. Kuhn thought it's one that went back to the 17th century, but whose true contours were still at a very early stage of emergence and being uncovered simultaneously in psychology, linguistics, anthropology, art history, history of science, and so forth. The problem at issue is, in the generic sense of a problem, the kind of difficulty that also receives elucidation in the book's account of what a scientific problem is. That is, the sort of difficulty that is not amenable to puzzle-solving techniques for its solution. And Kuhn claims that the book as a whole seeks to show that our current philosophical paradigm is in crisis. And that's what is generating these parallel problems. The philosophical project of the book as a whole is in one way modest, more modest than I think the readers, the commentators have thought, and in another way ambitious. It's to render the overall contours of the problem, qua problem, more perspicuous, so as to help us better understand what's occasioning this crisis, and to at least point the way towards a possible space of solutions. So structure wants to take seriously the idea that light will gradually begin to dawn over what is, as he puts it, somehow askew in the traditional philosophical paradigm, only if the difficulties this paradigm throws up are approached in ways that are appropriate to coming to terms with intellectual difficulties of this type, which is why he spent so much time trying to describe instances of people who have made progress with such difficulties, one reason. Kuhn, therefore, in structure, is frankly acknowledging he himself does not know how to solve the problem at the center of his book. The problem that he thinks is account of the nature of fundamental intellectual change, at least as it occurs throughout the history of science, furnishes the reader with a framework to understand. Nonetheless, he thinks the book can also offer helpful indications regarding ways in which the form of this, no longer scientific problem, no longer merely historiographical problem, philosophical problem, must undergo transformation if it is ultimately to admit of resolution or dissolution or some other form of solution. We can characterize that strategy now in this way. In structure, the author self-consciously goes about trying to break the frame through which he first encounters his own problem. That's a hard thing to go about trying to do if you don't know what's wrong with your friend. According to structure, the activity of puzzle solving is constitutive of normal science, and the breakdown of the conditions that make that, that dispensation of activity possible, that is, the situation that structure calls crisis, that breakdown is constitutive of what he calls the first stage of the scientific revolution. He thinks during this period, scientists must engage in, as I put it before, philosophical activity. And the book goes to considerable trouble to document this. This form of activity famously contrasts with the book's account of normal science. On the, a failure on the part of the normal scientific practitioner to solve a puzzle is taken to reflect not on the adequacy of the observational or conceptual or theoretical tools at his disposal, but rather on the individual scientist himself, on the extent of his acumen or scientific talent or industriousness, 
intellectual candor power, puzzle solving, ingenuity, or whatnot. It might not be clear exactly what defect in him <laughs> it's due to, but it, the problem's with him, not with the puzzle. One can arrive at a decent preliminary characterization of Kuhn's own conception of the nature of philosophy, one that's elaborated in later writings, including the lecture he might or might not have given in 1981 at Vico, um, his, his later conception of the nature of philosophy, one can get a decent preliminary characterization of it, I'm suggesting now, by simply introducing a negation operator into each of structure's descriptions of what a puzzle solving activity is. Negate each of the things that Kuhn says about what is constitutive of the activity that allows for science to flourish in a normal phase. So we can say now, completing this part of the exercise that has been left to the reader, it's constitutive of a philosophical problem that it not satisfy any of the following three conditions that the methods required for making progress with it are already in place. So that no entirely new way of thinking is required to make progress. You just, oh yeah, oh yeah, this is how you do it. Um, you know, you just bring the Fourier series to bear on it or whatever. Um, two, that the appropriate order of inquiry is one in which, before one goes about trying to solve the problem itself, the question of what is to count is a valid solution to be solved first. We don't know how to solve it, but let's first agree what would count as a solution. And then we'll solve it. Now, there have, I think, over and over again in the history of philosophy, been attempts to do something like that at phase two. But I think it follows from Kuhn's conception of philosophy. That's not going to be part of what he means by philosophy. And three, or a philosophical problem. And three, that one can at least, this is the third thing we're negating, that one can have a well-justified confidence that you're looking for the solution in roughly the right place when you're looking for one. So that failure to arrive at a solution reveals only something about your shortcomings as a philosophical problem solver. It doesn't reveal, well, reveal anything about the inadequacies of those problem solving methods. Nope, never like that in philosophy. The best philosopher can waste a hell of a lot of time, and it's not his fault. The preceding remarks, strictly thought through, <coughs> appear to entail the following conclusion. I think this follows from what I've said. I think everything I've said so far is in this book, but I think they entail this. There can be no such thing as normal philosophy. Or to put the point slightly more pointedly, the very idea of inquiry conducted within the confines of what Kuhn calls a paradigm, understood as a network of exemplary instances of philosophical work that everyone agrees should sustain, regulate, and substantively direct an entire tradition of puzzle-solving activity of the sort that Kuhn takes to be constitutive of normal science, involves a misunderstanding of the difference he cares so much about between puzzles and problems. Or, to put the point even more bluntly, we might put it like this. The concept of a philosophical paradigm is a contradiction in terms. That point is worth underlining because it appears to conflict with the central claim and structure, namely that the obstacles that the book encounters in trying to formulate its account of scientific paradigm change themselves are symptoms of a breakdown in what Kuhn calls the dominant philosophical paradigm of our time. I think there's a tension here. I won't try to spell it out anymore. We can go into the discussion. What I think I'll do instead is conclude by moving back to where we started. <coughs> First, um, in slide three here, we have some quotations where Kuhn talks about this. There's quite a few. I won't give you all of them, but I'll just point this out quickly. Um, he tells um, that we've given a lot of things so far in the first few chapters that look purely factual, but they also look to be counter instances to a prevalent epistemological theory. Pretty soon you'll start calling this a paradigm, and I want to call it a theory um, for reasons that have to do with how deep it goes. Um, and then he says some things about how you know people might think they can just get rid of this, um, but in fact, um, it seems that what we need is the emergence of a new and completely different analysis of science, with which they are no longer a source of trouble. Within which they're no, that should be within. Sorry, which they are no longer a source of trouble. Furthermore, if a typical pattern which in the next few chapters we'll observe 
the scientific revolutions is applicable here, that is to our philosophical problem, these anomalies will no longer seem to be simply facts. From, a, from within the new theory, they may seem instead very like tautologies, statements of situations that could not conceivably have been otherwise. And then he goes on to try to say something in detail about what he thinks the crucial assumptions are in the dominant epistemology that are causing trouble. And he thinks this has to do with a certain way of partitioning the role of sense data and the role of theory understood as an interpretation of sense data. So there's two steps. We observe, we have theories, and we can understand these two moments in science as completely factorizing from one another. And Kuhn thinks, in one way, that seems like common sense of how we're taught science is. Another way, he wants to say there's a deep assumption there, which he thinks these different disciplines, not just history of science, are questioning. I won't go into that now, but if people have questions, that's actually the heart of the book, trying to question that idea. What I will do instead is quickly show you some more quotations in conclusion. So um, we now move to um, the beginning of a very, oops, oh, I was warned that I would do that. Oops, ow, thank you. It's uh, so a very long passage. Um, this is a passage in which he says, what we want to say is that Aristotle and Gale, Galileo both saw the same thing but they interpreted it differently. They both looked at something like swinging stones or something like that. And where Galileo saw a pendulum, Aristotle saw a constrained fall or something. He's trying to come up with a description of the neutral thing they saw. <coughs> and he thinks it's essential part of a philosophical paradigm initiated by Descartes and others in this period that we describe things that way. He doesn't think that's how people thought about matters before the moment in science, which brings with it a change in how people think about the philosophy. Today's research in parts of philosophy, psychology, linguistics, even art history, I wonder about that even, all converge to suggest that the traditional paradigm, he's thinking especially of Gombrich here, that that traditional, this, that traditional paradigm is somehow askew. And then he goes on, on the next, and the continuation of this passage, do I risk it? I don't know. There it is. To note, none of these crisis-promoting subjects here has yet produced a viable alternate to the traditional philosophical paradigm. But they do begin to suggest what some of the characteristics of it must be. I am, for example, acutely aware. I'm going to look at my text instead of reading up there, because it occurs to me. You can't see me, and I can't speak in the microphone. I am, for example, acutely aware of the difficulties created by saying that when Aristotle and Galileo, looking at swinging stones, to say of them, the first saw a constrained fall, the second a pendulum. The same difficulties are presented in even more fundamental form by the opening sentences of this section. There I wrote, if you recall, though the world does not change with a change of paradigm, the scientist afterward works in a different world. Nevertheless, I am convinced that we must learn to make sense of statements that at least resemble these. What occurs during a scientific revolution is not fully reducible to an inter reinterpretation of individual and stable data. In times of crisis, Kuhn noted that it often proves immensely fruitful indeed for the honest and open-eyed scientist, then to say, the scientist who's now acquired a deep sense of how existing anomalies have piled up and interconnect, and why they each resist assimilation into existing categories. For such a scientist to actually allow himself to do something that Kuhn calls speaking a kind of nonsense, self-consciously. Saying things like, it's a way, but it's not propagated by me. Light is both the way and a part, and so on. Some of these statements will, he thinks, if there's successful clarification, be rendered unsayable in a satisfying way by the advent of a new paradigm. Through its providing a new set of categories, able to accommodate the whole range of phenomena, including those that appear to acquire a combination of incompatible categories. Others of these initially apparently nonsensical sentences, but we don't know which ones at first. It's part of the problem. 
are more likely to go a different route. And maybe not those sentences, but as he says, maybe ones that resemble them. We don't quite know how to formulate them yet. They might be rendered tautologies or axioms within the framework of the new way of thinking. So Kuhn, in this passage, and in a couple of other places, quite self-consciously goes in for what he calls himself nonsensical ways of talking. So it's the surprising thing, which has gone largely unnoticed, I think. He goes in for this when attempting to characterize what he takes to be the most problematic aspects of perceptual, theoretical, and ontological change that his book is seeking to spotlight. That is, those aspects of the cases that Kuhn thinks appear anomalous to us because we cannot help but view them through the lens of what he calls our dominant epistemological paradigm, which we inherited with the early modern scientific revolution. These nonsensical ways of talking are born out of a desire to maintain fidelity to all of the various aspects of the problem, not wanting to lose anything from view, and to properly characterize them as much as possible under the circumstances, even though the aspects in question appear to us to be incompatible, given our presently constrained set of options for thinking and talking about the issue in question. The issue in question here being the relationship between the scientist and the world, which he's trying to know. Kuhn admits, that is, he does not know how to solve the main problem. His book as a whole is trying to spotlight. But he thinks we need to acknowledge at least that what confronts us here is a problem and not a puzzle. He thinks in such a situation, the intellectually responsible thing to do is not to deny the existence of the problem, but rather to attempt to delineate its contours, making it at least visible to his readers as what he thinks it is, a problem. Kuhn could not, I think, actually, if you go back and look at the places in the book that this happens, be much more forthright than he is about what he's doing, even though it's been quite missed. That is, much more forthright about the fact that the ways of talking that he self-consciously is allowing himself to go in for in these contexts do not yet make sense by our present lights. And that is part of what is required um, what is required is a fundamental change in our philosophical paradigm, which would allow us to see how to make sense of at least some sentences resembling these. So we go to my last slide. If we go back and look at the notorious, I quoted the notorious statements at the beginning, the way they're always quoted, out of context. Here's Kuhn's main quote. Little context to end. The notorious statements are, if you look closely, actually explicitly flagged by Kuhn as examples of the sorts of attempts on his part that I've been talking about. Attempts to display potentially productive instances of sentences we cannot presently make sense of in the service of what I've called philosophical frame breaking. They are therefore always carefully prefaced by framing remarks that indicate them to be giving voice to philosophical temptations, temptations occasioned by an effort to do justice to the various anomalous features of the case at issue, features that he thinks are repressed or shunted to the side or otherwise minimized when we think only in terms of what he calls the dominant epistemological paradigm. I've given you the context of the two opening remarks and a few others. I don't want to bore you with too many quotations, but in each case, I've also italicized the kind of thing that's always dropped out, or almost always dropped out, when these things are quoted. Or it's kind of sneered at. I mean, he can't even bring himself to say what he's saying. What an idiot. Um, so, in the first quotation, he says, the historian of science may be tempted to exclaim. That was our first quotation. The second one, we have him saying, in the light of this, we may want to say that after a revolution. This looks like something we're forced to say by what I've said, but what does it mean? Next quotation, we have, I've again italicized, we, this, these, this situation may make us wish to say that Copernicus, after Copernicus, astronomers live in a different world. In the fourth quotation, we have, we'll urge us to say. In the fifth quotation, the last one, we'll keep these up to 
you want to look at them. Um, we have the one that I closed with. Um, the one which actually a piece of is the most famous part. Without quoting the end of the paragraph, I'm convinced that we must learn to make sense of statements that at least resemble these. To say that we must learn to do this is to say that we are not at present able to make sense of sentences resembling these. It's also to suggest that the particular sentences we will eventually learn to make sense of that will help us will not be exactly these, but rather ones to some presently unspecifiable degree may resemble these. To criticize such passages drawn from Kuhn's book, quoting them apart from the carefully prepared context in which they occur, on the grounds that they involve a false philosophical claim, which is the standard criticism, is to miss entirely what he's doing. In one sense, judged by Kuhn's own lights, this criticism is much too nice. For if Kuhn's right, these statements are not even false. They're in much worse shape than that. But once one understands that he does not take them exactly to be candidates for truth or falsehood as they stand, it should also become clear that the criticism is misdirected. It fails to account, take account of his aim in coming out with such intentionally transitional locutions, namely to cause us to become philosophically restless in ways that will provoke us to do better than he was able to while hopefully also providing us with some of the desiderata that we will need to take into account if we're going to come up with a genuinely satisfying solution to his problem. To miss the ways in which Kuhn seeks to do what I've called breaking his own philosophical frame, and why he thinks he should be trying to do this, and why he thinks we should be trying to do this, is, I suggest in conclusion, to miss the core of his book. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.